When the Gilded Age began in Buffalo, New York, it was already well on its way to becoming an undeniable boomtown. Buffalo was a vibrant waterfront metropolis, strategically located where Lake Canal and rail traffic converged. It was one of the richest cities in America. Industry and big tech boomed, and the brightest minds came to cash in on the new way of doing things. The fast-growing city of 118,000 people was bustling with commercial activity, with residents and visitors buzzing through hotels, saloons, factories, stores, and other businesses. The whole city was revolutionized. It was connected by an extensive park system, which was designed by renowned landscape architects Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux, from 1868 to 1896. To provide universal access to open space and fresh air to all citizens of Buffalo, featuring multiple parkways and parks for public use in many parts of the city, it was the first coordinated park system in the nation, and was interlaced with Ellicott's 1804 plan for the city. This laid out the streets of Buffalo with a grand design and a radical road pattern that sought to imbue the suburbs with Parisian style. Adorned with roundabouts, tree-lined avenues, and fountains that figured into a beautification plan, Olmsted declared Buffalo as the best planned city as to streets, public places, and grounds in the United States, if not the world. The citizens of Buffalo also contributed to beautifying the city. A group called the Tree Planters supervised the planting of 1,000 trees each year along the parkways. By the 1870s, more than 20,000 trees shaded the streets. They formed natural archways along the avenues, and Buffalo became known as the city of beautiful trees. Beautiful parks, churches, theaters, libraries, museums, and a free public school system all contributed to make Buffalo a fine residential city. The police department was enlarged to keep pace with the city's growth. And a permanent fire department was formed to combat the fierce fires that plagued the city from time to time. As many families still owned private carriages, a carriage mounting stone and a hitching post stood by the curb in front of many homes. In addition, drinking troughs for the horses were placed conveniently throughout the city. Although many families owned their own carriages and horses, by the 1850s public transportation was needed. And by 1863, there were 11 miles of well-built double-track street railways throughout the city. The cars were drawn by horses and greatly facilitated travel between distant sections of the city. By the end of the 1890s, Buffalo had grown to a city of 350,000, and the streets were crowded with traffic. Horse-drawn wagons, carts, carriages, bicycles, and horse cars. Were steadily being replaced by electric trolley cars and automobiles since their permanent introduction in 1890. Buffalo's newly paved streets were ideal for motoring. Soon, automobiles became so numerous in the city that courtesy rules had to be issued and speed restrictions enforced. Speed limits within the city were five miles an hour on Main Street, eight miles in less congested areas. And 15 miles in streets where traffic was exceptionally light, the ladies enjoyed automobiling too. Ladies have become expert in guiding and running autos. A lady could be seen driving her electric phaeton along Delaware Avenue on a shopping trip, or to attend a club meeting. Downtown was flooded with hundreds of wires strung on high poles, through which the electric power to accommodate the trolley lines, the new telephone lines. And other power needed was transmitted from Niagara Falls. Buffalo had become one of the most important centers of trade and commerce in the country. There was a time when ships and freight trains dominated the waterfront, and for years afterwards, Buffalonians wouldn't think of hanging out by the lake. Buffalo was thriving and became a city of wealth and culture, where the residents enjoyed new luxuries. In 1901. Buffalo's industries were a recipe for greatness, and the city's millionaires and its mansions rivaled New York City. Buffalo was the eighth largest city in the country and had 60 millionaires, 
more per capita than any other American city, and it was Delaware Avenue where the wealthy settled. During the 1880s and 90s, Delaware became known as Millionaire's Row, with architects brought in who were designing homes elsewhere for the likes of Vanderbilt's and Astor's. Large, comfortable mansions lined the tree-shaded avenues and parkways. In many of the mansions, parlor maids, cooks, gardeners, and coachmen were employed. Most of the social life centered around the family. Entertainments were held in private homes, and elaborate dinners were served. Food was abundant and of great variety. Fresh vegetables and meat were brought into the city markets from nearby farms, and more exotic foods, such as oysters, fish, and terrapin, were imported by rail from New York City. Blocks of ice were delivered to the door daily and placed in an ice box. Milk, eggs, and butter were delivered to the door by a farmer, and huskers brought in wagons of fresh vegetables and farm produce when in season. Every spring, the house was thoroughly cleaned, windows and curtains washed, furniture moved, floors polished, and all heavy rugs hung on the clothesline in the yard to be beaten clean with a rug beater. The women devoted their time to church and charitable work. Many of Buffalo's charities were founded by women, like the Society for the Preservation of Cruelty to Animals and the Women's Christian Association. Families enjoyed picnics in the park band concerts, and boating in the summertime. And in the winter, skating was a popular sport. Delaware Pond was crowded with the youth and beauty of the city on skates, enjoying band music and the moonlight. Sleighing parties were also fashionable. The host provided several large, gaily decorated sleighs, drawn by a team of beautifully matched horses. The guests would tuck into the sleighs, donning feet warmers, and covered with heavy fur robes to keep warm. They sang lively songs to the sleigh bells on the trip out of town, perhaps to the cataract house at Niagara Falls. Upon arriving there, they would be served hot mulled drinks before a blazing long fire, and later enjoyed an oyster stew supper, followed by dancing lively dances, like the heel-to-toe polka, the gallop, or the waltz. Three of Buffalo's largest churches the Old First Presbyterian Church, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, and St. Joseph's Cathedral, sometimes simply referred to as the churches, were located in the neighborhood of Church and Main Streets with a grassy, tree-shaded park between them. The history of these churches is one of friendship and tolerance. Growing up side by side, they helped one another in times of stress. Buffalo has long been a patron for the sports. And in the era following the Civil War, curling, bowling, and baseball were among the popular games played by the young men of the city. Bowling became a popular pastime, and by 1889, there were eight bowling clubs listed in the sporting directory of Buffalo. At this time, ladies were trying their skill at the game. The sporting directory showed there were four regular ladies' bowling clubs in the city, gallantly stating, in whatever branch of physical training the ladies have entered, they have been able to hold their own. Among the devotees of bowling are married and single ladies and girls. Department stores and banks had ladies' teams, and other companies also promoted the sport. The game of baseball was also played in Buffalo as early as 1857, but it did not become a popular sport until after the Civil War. By 1877, Buffalo had 40 baseball teams, and that year, the Buffalo Baseball Association set up ball grounds at Niagara and Rhode Island streets that could seat 3,000 people. The Pan American Exposition celebrated the city's prowess as an industrial, commercial, and cultural center in 1901. The World's Fair attracted 8 million visitors to the 350-acre fairgrounds. Viewers would marvel each night as over 100,000 light bulbs were switched on while a live orchestra played, illuminating the fairground buildings, canals, and fountains in an unprecedented spectacle. At a time when most American cities did not utilize hydroelectricity on such a large scale, this illumination heralded Buffalo as a gateway to the new, modern 20th century to come. 
After this, Buffalo became known as the City of Light. The town continued to thrive into the 20th century, attracting a number of industries to the region. As new technology and transportation networks evolved, the steel industry and automobile industry became the prime industries in Buffalo. Large corporations such as the Bethlehem Steel Company, Pierce Aero Company, Larkin Company, and the Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Company made a significant impact on the city, providing thousands of jobs. This economic boom was accompanied by significant investments in the arts. The Buffalo and Erie County Historical Museum was opened in a converted building from the Pan American Exposition shortly after. The plutocrats of bygone Buffalo showed off more than their houses. They also set up an arts institution they could brag about, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, which has been acquiring great works since 1890 and exhibiting them in a palatial Beaux-Arts building, where Buffalo's high society set its sights on proving its worth by purchasing paintings year after year. The arts and crafts movement bloomed at the Rowcraft campus in East Aurora, and jazz musicians flocked to the city to play at the Colored Musicians Club. The Gilded Age was drawing to a close, but the city had become one of the important centers of trade and commerce in the country. Buffalo was a leader in grandeur. There were mansions, there was novel art and architecture, and there was light.